It's so fun to preach after they sing. I love it. And this week, the song and the sermon just fit together like that, and it was God or the Spirit or something that brought it together um, because Ryan and I did not compare notes. So, perfect. Thank you. Several years ago, I heard a story that has stayed with me mostly because I have to admit I just don't understand it. It's a true story about a woman whose life was coming apart at the seams. When one of her friends told her about a silent retreat at a nearby convent, she decided to give it a try. She had never done anything like this before. And once she arrived, she received her room assignment and was standing in the dormitory elevator with her suitcase in her hand when a short, plump nun stepped in beside her. The woman pressed the button for the fourth floor. The nun pressed the button for the third floor. And then the nun said, what brings you to us, my dear? And the woman, for unknown reasons, spilled her guts. My mother just died. I think my father may be an alcoholic. My marriage is falling apart. And I feel like I'm just going crazy. My life is in little shattered pieces lying all over the ground, she said. And before she could say anything more, the elevator went ding and the doors opened. The nun gave the woman a funny little smile and she said, God must love you very much. And then she disappeared as the doors closed. God must love you very much? What does that mean? We don't tend to think of a string of catastrophes as a sign of God's love. But that nun was clearly making some sort of connection. Well, our traditional word from Isaiah 40 may give us some sort of understanding of what the nun was talking about. Now, I know it's in small print on your bulletin, so if you can't see it, I'll read it. These words may be familiar because this is a text that has been read many times. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is God who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows upon them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. The one who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. 
According to the historian Charles Beard, one of the lessons of history can be summarized by this proverb. The bee fertilizes the flower it robs. The bee fertilizes the flower it robs. This is particularly true of the history of Israel during the time this scripture was written. Think about it. The people were in exile. God had led them into the wilderness, not just the desert, but the wasteland of despair, so that God could speak to their hearts. This is the scripture, in, or this is the situation in which this scripture was written. And although the nation of Israel had been robbed and plundered by the other conquering nations, their experience of historical tragedy deepened their reliance on God. So this part of the book of Isaiah, which I just read, is often called Second Isaiah. It was written about 540 BCE. The purpose of chapter 40 was to comfort the nation of Israel because they had been in exile in Babylon and were wondering if God even cared about them anymore. There must have been many Jews who watched the procession of idols in the Babylonian festivals and all but conceded that their own God could not even compare to the gods of Babylonia. Their faith was broken into tiny little pieces and lying all around them. I mean, really, they're slaves to Babylon. And all the gods of Babylon are processing in front of them. Against the mood of this despair, the prophet raises his voice. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Yahweh is the everlasting God. At that point, what would you think? You're a slave in Babylon. Yeah, right. Yahweh is the everlasting God. Huh. Have you ever been so down in the dumps, so broken, that you wondered if God even cared? Do you wonder if all those broken pieces will ever come together and be whole again? Or have you ever questioned God's divine wisdom? To all the questions of suffering, the prophet answers, have you not known? Have you not heard? God is everlasting. And second Isaiah's prophet argues that those who are weary from carrying around the weight of the world should expectantly wait for God to renew their strength. But they had to be patient in the midst of suffering. In fact, we know, looking backwards on history, that the stories of the Hebrew Bible from Israel's impatience and insistence on propped action from God typically became what? Their undoing. An attitude that can wait for God will gain strength to rise above the moment and not tire, and not faint, but go forward. Now, the eagle is associated with divine power in most religions. For several Native American tribes, the eagle was a source of healing and life-renewing rain. And second, Isaiah says that those who wait on the Lord are renewed and mount up like wings on eagles. An eagle wing is a sign of healing. And you know the song that is associated with Isaiah 4, 40, the one I just read, is what? On eagle's wings. Isaiah 40 and a couple of other um, texts are written into a beautiful song called On Eagle's Wings. An eagle wing is a sign of healing from God. But the key word here is wait. 
It's something most of us don't like to do. Isaiah does not say that those who demand a solution mount up on wings like eagles. Isaiah does not say that those who pray for a solution mount up on wings like eagles. He does not say that those who believe in a solution mount up on wings like eagles. He does not say that those who do good things mount up on wings like eagles. He says to wait. It's a hard, difficult lesson. Waiting is not fun. We're in, we're in the middle of a struggle. So the lesson here is, if you want to find peace in your life, do what? Wait. If you want to end the pain in your life, wait. If you're grieving, wait. If you're struggling to make sense of all the chaos and pain, wait. If your life is broken apart and lying in pieces on the ground, wait. My grace is sufficient for you, God said, for power is made perfect in weakness. Who would have thought that? We have to wait. Last weekend, Eric and I were driving home from Eureka Springs, Arkansas. It was early in the morning, and the drive was stunning if we hadn't um, been very early in the morning driving back. And we were in eastern, southeastern Kansas, and there were all kinds of birds, and they were just flying over, and their wingspans were amazing. There were um, lots of hawks and eagles and just beautiful birds flying around. And as we were coming, we were watching about four or five big birds with mighty wingspans. And both of us were just kind of quiet in the car. And all of a sudden, I said, look at the wingspan on that one. And it came across a couple of times. And as it came across the last time, we both said at the same time, it's a bald eagle. And we saw the white um, face and then the yellow on it. And it was Certainly enough, bald eagle. Absolutely stunning. About nine that morning. It was one of those moments you just couldn't expect. Just beautiful. And if we hadn't been up early and out, we would not have noticed it. But we had to wait. Three cups of coffee and five hours in the car. Wait. Now, thought. We might need to move to the pulpit mic here because mine is cutting out, D'Angelo. Thank you. Power is made perfect in weakness. I suppose this can all sound for the world like divine meanness, but I don't believe that's what it really is. Instead, Think about it this way. Perhaps this is how God defends us from the super apostles of the world, those stainless steel Christians who want to cleanse the church from problematic people. Hang on with me now. Our scriptures today are proof that God will not go along with those. God knows that being problematic is just part of being human. Every one of us suffers from some thorn or another. Every one of us has days or even whole years, perhaps, when we are short, weak, insecure, and tactless. But the good news is that none of us, none of that, disqualifies us from serving God. On the contrary, those things belong on our list of credentials, because the fact is that the church survives with people like us in charge. And that's the surest proof in the world 
that Jesus is alive and well and dwelling in us. How else could we have endured either as individuals or as a church? God's grace is sufficient. Sue Bender wrote about a bowl that she saw that was broken and then put back together. She wrote, I saw strikingly handsome Japanese tea bowl that had been broken and pieced together. The image of that bowl made a lasting impression. Instead of trying to hide the flaws, the cracks were emphasized and filled with silver. The bowl was even more precious after it had been mended. Now we've talked about this before. It's called kintsuki. I'm still not sure about what the nun was trying to tell the woman in the elevator. But I think it had everything to do with what the woman was trying to find out at the convent on her week away from the world of her shattered life. That in the very midst of her losses, feeling like the pieces of her life were lying on the ground all around her, that the sky was falling, that she was about to be more eligible than she had ever been to discover the power of Christ that is made perfect in weakness. It is the power that enables each of us to make our own fool's speeches, thinking back on all the awful and wonderful things that have happened to us we can say along with the nun, God must love us very, very much. Amen.